Hello and praise the Lord, everybody. I'm Pastor Joshua Glick. And I'm Leah Glick. And we're part of the Journey Up Church. We're so excited to have each and every one of you join us here today for another edition of our cyber service. If you enjoyed today's service or if it ministered to you in any way, please feel free to like it, comment, reach out to us. Um, if you feel like someone else could use it, please feel free to share it. And more importantly, if you need a Bible study or would like to learn more about God, reach out to us. We would be more than happy to sit down with you and talk about God and, and just go on this journey with you. And for our Journey Up family, we now also have the ability to give online. And so to do that, you can go to our website at ourjourneyup.com. Dot org. We pray today that this message blesses you and go with God in Jesus' name. So even on the onset of this service, we're going to lift him up. We're going to give God praise. Amen. And let's somebody, I want somebody to worship here today with me. Amen. And invite the presence of the Lord into this house in Jesus' name. For our God is still great and he is still glorious in this house. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. Our God is great and glorious. We put our trust in your name, Jesus. Able to save and deliver us. We put our hope in your name, Jesus. We're singing blessing and honor, glory and power run to our God forever and ever. All of the honor, all of the praise is yours, yours forever.
hallelujah. Why don't we put our hands together and give the Lord some praise here in this place. Lord, we love you. We worship you. Amen. We magnify you. We lift you up, Jesus. Hallelujah. We give you glory and honor and praise. Hallelujah today. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. I can't think of a better time, a better place, a better reason to worship our Jesus here today. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name. What a beautiful name it is to know that the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's give, keep, continue to give him praise and glory Hallelujah. in this house. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Was the word at the beginning. Yes, God. One with Hallelujah, God, we give you glory. Amen. We give you praise here in this house. Hallelujah. All power in heaven and earth belongs to you today. Amen. There is nothing greater. There is nothing bigger. There is nothing stronger, God, that you cannot do, Lord, here in this house today. Lord, so here we are today. We're reaching for you. We're looking for you, God. Amen. To have your way in this house. 
in the name of Jesus.
Hallelujah, my God. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Why don't you tell him right now? Amen, God. Amen. We want you to move in this house. God, we want you to move, Lord, in this service today. Hallelujah. Lord, in the name, get us out of the way. Get this old flesh out of the way. Amen. Get every wandering thought, every wandering heart out of the way, God, I pray. And let your spirit flow, God, in this place. Let your spirit move, God, in this house. Lord, in the name of Jesus, oh, hallelujah. God, we love you and we praise you. We worship you, God. We lift you up and we give you glory. Amen and honor and praise in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord.
love you. We praise you. Amen. Hallelujah. We give you glory. God, we give you all the honor and praise today in the name of Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. I love you and I praise you, God, today in the name of Jesus Christ. Oh, hallelujah. Praise God. I do have a message that I, I feel from the Lord today. And uh, it comes from the book of Samuel, chapter 17, and it, uh, verses 1 through 10, and then verses 32 through 45. Now, I would dare say that every single one of us have heard this story before. Amen. But if you'll allow me a few brief moments here today, I, I hope somebody can preach with me and help me with uh, 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 anointing a God to, uh, uh, to speak to somebody's heart here today in the name of Jesus. Praise God. First Samuel chapter 17 verse 1 it says this. It says, Now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle and were gathered together at Shecho, which belongeth to Judah, and pitched between Shecho and Ezekah in Ephes to Mim. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Elah, and set the battle in array against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on a mountain on the one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side. And there was a valley between them. And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits in a span. And he had a helmet of brass upon his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. And he had greaves of brass upon his legs and a target of brass between his shoulders. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron, and one bearing a shield went before him. And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel, and said unto them, Why are ye come out to set your battle in array? Am not I a Philistine, and ye servants of Saul? Choose you a man for you, and let him come down to me. If he be able to fight with me and to kill me, then, then will we be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall ye be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. And verse 32 says, And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant, thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he but a man of war from his youth. And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear, and took a, took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him and smote him, and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. David said, Moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion, and now the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with thee. And Saul armed David with his armor, and he put a helmet of brass upon his head. Also, he armed him with a coat of mail. And David girded his sword upon his armor, and he essayed to go, for he had not proved it. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off of him. And he took him a staff in his hand. He chose him five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had even in a script. And, he, and his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. And the Philistine came on and drew near unto David, and the man that bare the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth and ruddy and of a fair countenance. And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog that thou comest to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field. 
Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword, and with a spear, and with a shield. But I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, and the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. Amen. You'll allow me just for a few moments here today. With the help of the Lord, I want to I want to preach on the subject, you're not David. You're not David. Amen. Hallelujah. Lord, we love you. God, we give you glory. We give you all the honor, Lord. We give you all the praise today in the name of Jesus Christ. I love you, Lord, and I praise you. And I pray, God, that you would open up our hearts. God, I pray that you would speak to us, God, in this service today. God, we know you're greater. We know you're bigger, God. We know that you can handle anything that comes our way and help us, God, today to have our faith, have our face fixed upon you, Lord, in this place. We love you and we praise you. And we pray, God, that your will will be done in this service. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said amen. 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 Praise God. Turn to somebody and tell them you're not David. Amen. You may be seated. God bless each and every one of you. Now, let me set up the background here this afternoon. Israel's ancient arch enemy has been encroaching deep into Israeli territory. The Philistines have now set up a war camp. Right in Judah itself, in Judah's own land. And they are making constant threats against God's people. And if that weren't enough that their ancient enemy is trying to steal their land, if that weren't enough that the Philistines are blatantly, openly, unashamedly challenging Israel on their own turf, here we find in this story Israel's leader no longer leading, but he's cowering to the blasphemous challenge that's heard from the enemy. Here we find a backslidden King Saul being just as terrified as his soldiers are. And without any spiritual leadership, it appears that Israel's defeat is imminent. And here they are, facing a problem on top of a problem, with no one to help them in one of their darkest hours. I'm talking about a situation here of hopelessness. I'm describing a situation of, of despondency on top of discouragement. It was a situation of disheartenment on top of dejection. You see, it wasn't just a moment of an experiencing the calm before a storm. You see, they weren't waiting for defeat to happen in their lives, but in their minds and in their hearts, defeat had already come. Defeat was already there long before the giant stepped on the scene. And on top of all of those things, not only did Israel have a problem within a problem, that being led by another problem, but Israel had yet another gigantic problem to face. Because the Philistines also had a gigantic champion named Goliath. Now keep in mind that this is not the first time the Israelites have faced giants before. They had seen them before. They have experienced giants before. And their track record in running across giants up to that point was not great. When the Israelites were on the verge of conquering their promised land, 10 of the 12 spies concluded that the promised land was impossible to inhabit. Why? Uh, precisely because there were giants in the land. They were extremely afraid, amen, of the giants that lived in those areas. Now, just the sight of giants had defeated a whole nation in the past. Just the thought of giants struck fear in the hearts of God's people before. And as a result, God let a whole generation wander in the wilderness for 40 years of their fear of confronting these giant people. Only after they died off did the Lord allow Joshua and Caleb to lead a new generation into conquering that land. Amen. Scripture tells us that when Joshua conquered the Anakims, or the son of Anak, that they relocated to five city-states in the south, one of which was a city by the name of Gath. And Gath is where we find this giant of a man named Goliath. 
Now here we are again. You see what's happening here? Here's the same old problem again. I've been here before. Here comes that old thing that's tried to defeat us in our past or maybe had defeated us in our past. There was a giant named Goliath from Gath and descended from the same ancient race of giant men. And here he is threatening Israel once more. And once more, almost like the same reiteration of the history of the, histories of the Chronicles of Israel, here uh, we find that fear and doubt have completely paralyzed the Israelites once again. In other words, they didn't learn the first time. And Goliath was not just simply a giant. But can I dare ask the question here in the service today? How many times has the greatest thing you feared try to come back from your ugly past to challenge you and to rob you from your spiritual promises? How many times has a thing that has seemingly defeated you, but somehow you escaped it, you seem to be constantly running from it, but here it is again in the life today. And now, and now it's in your territory. Now it's on your ground. Now it's in your family. Now it's calling you out, and it's alive and well, and it's not afraid of you. And Goliath wasn't just simply a giant. His armor is described in great detail for a reason, and not just because it was heavy. He is armed with a coat of mail, or literally a breastplate of scales. So allow me to present this simple thought here this afternoon. Goliath is a picture of the snake that defeated Adam in the Garden of Eden. And when Adam failed, when Adam sinned, when it seemed that Adam was defeated by that old snake, there was then a promise that came from God that Jesus, or the seed of the woman, would one day crush the head of the serpent in Genesis 3 and 15. And let me just push and the pause here uh, button here today to say that, that God loves you enough to give somebody some hope in this message today. Hallelujah. In other words, your story doesn't have to end in defeat. Your story doesn't have to, doesn't have to uh, end in dismay. Although it seems like you've fallen or sometimes it seems like you come up short. Although it may seem that hurts and troubles may have gotten you down before. I'm here to tell somebody that there is still a promise waiting for somebody to get a hold of in this service today. Somebody needs to be encouraged and to know the simple truth that if God be for you, who can stand against you? If God is on your side. Amen. There ain't no devil. There isn't any enemy that can come against the hand of the people of God. In other words, when the devil wants to start to prepare for war, God has already provided a plan. Hallelujah. When the devil starts to plunder, God's already provided protection. When the enemy tries to bring up your penalty in life, God's reminded him that the price has been paid. Hallelujah. When the devil comes to persecute you, God knows how to step in with the promise. I want to preach to somebody here today. You might be saying, what's going on in this crazy nation? What's going on in this crazy old world that we're living? Or what's going on in my family? Or what's going on in my life? You see in our country, you see in this country right now, problem happening on top of problem. Situation compounding itself on top of situation. You may be experiencing a moment where old fears may be becoming present fears in your life. And our leadership isn't fighting. Our leadership seems to be afraid. Nobody wants to step up any longer. Nobody wants to come and fight against the giants in our lives. And we've tried to run from it before, but this time it seems that we just can't escape it. We can't get away from it. And here it is, challenging us once again in the moment of this hour. And we're saying, God, where are you at? God, what you doing? God, we need the divine touch, Lord, from you. Oh, I want to tell somebody today that you, if, if you can hold on, amen, hold on, saint of God, hold on, man or woman of God, hold on, weary soldier, because your promises are coming, your deliverance is a coming, your healing is a coming, your blessing is on its way. 
Because not only did God give us a promise that one day he would crush the head of that old serpent, but in this story we're about to see David, the ancestor of Jesus Christ, defeat Goliath with a head wound as well. Each day Goliath came issuing that same old challenge. He would fight whatever champion Israel selects. And whoever wins this one-on-one combat will win the victory for their respective nation. Sounds good, right? Sounds like a fair exchange or a fair challenge, right? You see, but this was an unfair proposition. This was an unfair fight. This fight was already pre-planned, it was staged, it was lopsided, and all of the cards were in the Philistines' hands. This challenge didn't even make any sense. How am I supposed to work this out in my life? I thought this problem was long gone. How am I supposed to make this happen? I don't know what, I don't have the means, I don't have the ability, I don't have the resources. God, this challenge isn't even fair. I want somebody to note that Saul should be Saul should have been Israel's champion against Goliath. After all, they chose him to be their king so he could go out before us and fight our battles, as in 1 Samuel 8 and 20. The nation of Israel basically chose Saul because how tall he was. But, he, but this enemy, this challenge, and this obstacle was much taller. It was much bigger. It was insurmountable. It was much greater. And Saul was as terrified as his soldiers were. But I feel in my heart, I feel in my spirit an expectation. I feel some excitement in my bones this afternoon because God is about to raise up somebody. God is about to raise up an unlikely champion to go before the people and to win the victory. Can I say that God is going to raise up an unlikely champion? God is going to raise up an unlikely person. God is going to raise up someone or something. It's so insignificant. It may seem so little. It may seem so meaningless uh, that you're not going to even understand at first uh, that the key to your victory is already in your hands. And no, you don't deserve it. No, it's not going to make any sense. But your job isn't to understand God. Your job is to trust the Lord. God is going to move in your life in a way in which you're not going to get the glory for it. It's going to be an unlikely way. It's going to be an awkward way. It's going to be a peculiar way. It's going to be an unorthodox way. But God will work in your life to prove himself uh, that it's not going to be by your might and it's not going to be by your power, but it's going to be by his spirit, saith the Lord. Hold on, my friend. Hold on, weary saint. Victories are coming. Hold on, sister. Hold on, dear brother. Victory is on its way. Keep on praying, child of God. The miracle is a coming. Keep fast in church. The promise is coming soon. And when Goliath sees a mere youth approaching him, he laughs disdainfully. He has no idea who he is actually dealing with. Somebody has to understand this today. Somebody's got to get a hold of this thought. This is not a battle between a massive giant and a small boy, but this is a battle between a small giant and a massive God. And only David had a proper perspective on Israel's enemy. And that's exactly why he won. In other words, in your life, uh, stop saying, how am I going to work this out? Stop saying, how am I going to confront this giant? Somebody needs to remove yourself from the equation and add a great big God right into the middle of your valley, right into the middle of your problem, right into the middle of your fears. Several times in 1 Samuel chapter 17, we are told that Goliath has defied not just Israel, but he defied the God of Israel. And there was no greater person than David that was more passionate about the name of the Lord. 
I want to know if there's anybody here today at the Journey Up Church that's still passionate for the Lord. Does anybody still have an inward passion or an outward purpose or still going towards an upward path? Hallelujah. Is anybody still on fire today? Is anybody still excited about living for God? Oh, in other words, I don't care what they say about me. I don't care if you talk about me. I don't care if you drag me through the mud, make fun of me, or try to get me triggered or offended. I, I don't care what Facebook says, what Twitter says, or what the social mafia says says I don't even care what you may say about this church but if you mess with my God but if you mess with my Jesus that's another story if you mess with my God I'm going to start to roll up my sleeve sister roll sister Rose if you try to defy the Lord in front of me I'm going to get ready for a battle I'm going to get ready for the challenge that's before me you talk about my God I'm going to start preparing for spiritual warfare those are fighting words and I'm not talking about the kind of fighting with fists or guns, but, but make no mistake here today, I'm going to be hitting my knees in prayer. I'm going to be waging war against the enemy, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through the pulling down of strongholds. Hey, don't you mess with my Jesus, and let me take it another step farther if you'll allow me today. Don't you mess with my worship. Don't you mess with my praise. Don't you mess with my holiness living for God. Amen. Don't don't you mess with my brother. Don't you mess with my sister. Because if you do, I'm going to be hitting my knees in prayer. I'm going to be hitting my knees and touching the throne of God. That giant problem named Goliath committed blasphemy before God. And, bl and that was a capital offense in ancient Israel. And that kind of a capital offense in the law was punishable by death by stoning. So guess what? Stoning is precisely what David set out to do to Goliath. Amen. Three times in 1 Samuel chapter 17, we see Goliath described as a Philistine's champion. Now, the word translated champion literally means man of the between. Because Goliath stands between the Philistines and Israel. But an unexpected victory is won when David becomes Israel's unlikely champion. David became their representative. David became the man between them and their enemy. And do you know what I like about that? is that God can still use small things to take down giant obstacles. We may be small here today. We may be few in number, but the church plus God equals victory. The small church plus a great big God equals promises fulfilled. The small work plus a big God equals overcoming giant problems, overcoming giant obstacles, overcoming giant circumstances. Also, God will get the glory out of it. It's a wonderful thing to be able to read the scriptures and to draw strength and instruction and inspiration and encouragement from the lives of God's people. After all, the Bible gives us permission to do that. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and 11 says, Now all these things happened unto them for examples, and they are written for our, our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. So you know how people are. We like to interject ourselves into every story. And the story of David and Goliath is no different. That's why there are so many Christian books about defeating the giants in your life. And all of these books feature you as being David and your problem being your Goliath. And of course, you are always victorious in the end. Consumers buy them. Uh, Christians read them. Pastors use them as the basis of sermon series. I've done it myself. And everybody lives happily ever after. Just scan the shelves of your local Christian bookstore. You'll find them everywhere. I made a short list. Courage to face the giant. Facing the giants. Facing your giants. 
facing Goliath, taking on Goliath. This is how I fight my battles. Twelve ways to win against your giant. Giant killers overcoming the giants that rob you of your best life. Raising giant killers. Releasing your child's divine destiny. Slaying the giants in your life. And Goliath must fall. But if we're honest, we'd have to admit that it's not always quite that simple. Not every one of our personal stories here today are David and Goliath stories. Why is that? Because giants tend to be fierce foes. And if we're, if we're to be extremely honest here today, sometimes we can be very fickle heroes. Sometimes we can fail. We forget that Paul's statement in 1 Corinthians 10 and 11 that I just read it's preceded by a list of Israel's failures and followed by this statement, 1 Corinthians 10 and 12, it says, Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. You see, there's a type of reading the Bible in this hour where I'm always the hero. I'm always innocent Abel, but I'm never hateful Cain. I'm always loyal Abraham, but I'm never greedy Lot. I'm always faithful Joseph, but never his conniving brothers. I'm always brave Moses, but never the rebels worshiping around the golden calf just a few weeks after God delivered me from Egypt. I'm always the three Hebrew boys who won't bow down, but never the multitude of Jewish boys who cave in to the pressure. I'm always the disciple who follows, but never the Pharisee who judges. I'm always brave Peter on that day of Pentecost, but I'm never that cowardly disciple who denied Christ three times. And I'm always fearless David defeating the giant, but I am never backslidden King Saul cowering in his tent and never the Israelite army shaking in their boots on that hillside while Goliath roars out his threats. But can I, can I preach plain today? Can I just be honest? Can I be transparent? You're not always the hero. You don't hear this kind of preaching everywhere. You're not always the hero. Sometimes you're the, you're the rebel. Come on, somebody. Is somebody with me today? Sometimes you're the coward. Sometimes you're the Pharisee. Sometimes you can be the bad guy. Sometimes you can be the victim or the loser, the sinner, the failure. And if you can't bring yourself to even admit that, then you're missing half of the message of Scripture. Maybe even the more important half. <laughs> Anything else is a misreading of the Bible. It says that that makes man the champion and not God. Lifts up man. But not God. That's the original lie from the serpent that got us into this whole mess in the first place, folks. Genesis 3 and 5, uh, 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 Satan told, uh, uh, said, said, ye shall be as gods. We're not here to raise up ourselves as the champion. We're here to raise up God as the champion in our lives. The reason why your can-do attitude and your self-help books and your man-made principles and your worked-up courage aren't working in your life is because they're not supposed to. In other words, let me put it like this. It's because you're not David. You've tried to kill your giant in your life, but he keeps getting back up. Throwing that spear, wielding, wielding that sword, pushing you back, threatening your life and striking fear in the midst of your heart. Do you know why? Because you're not David. You've been faithful. Yes, you've been obedient. Yes, you've been prayerful. Yes, you've been hopeful. But it seems like it still doesn't seem to be working. And the power still doesn't seem to be in your control because the giant is still roaring. The battle is still waging. Your strength is still failing. And your joy seems to be fading, failing. Uh, why? It's very simple. It's because you're not David. Many sermons have been preached from David's story and perspective, encouraging us to battle the giants that plague our lives. 
And in all of those sermons, there we are in the place of David, fighting against insurmountable odds and and winning with the help of the Lord. But somebody here, this simple preacher here this afternoon, if there's anything I can say here that I pray sticks with your heart, it's this. Somebody's got to get a hold of this here today. The real message of 1 Samuel 17 is not that we are called to be like David. Rather, it's that we have a David. David in our life. Here we are standing on the hillside with all of humanity, scared and scarred by what the snake has done to us and by all of his threats, by all of his taunts, by all of his tricks. But then down in the valley we see Jesus all alone facing the wrath of the Jewish Sanhedrin and the might of the Roman Empire. He looks so small. He looks so weak as he hangs on a cruel cross. He has no weapons in his hands to fight with except himself and the name that he carries. And the snake laughs because he thinks he has already won, but he has no idea just how lopsided this fight actually is. And now let me make the parallel here today. Now in our main text in the valley called Elah. There stood a young boy by the name of David who stood all alone between Israel and between the enemy. And I want to tell you, I want to let somebody I want someone to know that, that what was at stake was not just his life, but it was all of their lives. It wasn't just him on the line, but it was all of Israel that was on the line. What was at stake was the future of a nation. In other words, the outcome of his battle would be the outcome of their battle. The Israelites did not fight. They were too scared to fight. All they could do was hope because their future literally rested on David's shoulders as he walked out to face that giant. And just like David, on that lonely hill called Golgotha, Jesus stood between us and our enemy. And what was at stake was not just his life, but what was at stake was each and every one of our lives today. The outcome of his battle will be the outcome of our battle here today. He is our champion. Jesus is the man of the between. He hangs on the cross between us and between judgment. He still stands today between us and sin, between us and certain death. Our eternity literally rests on his shoulders. As he faced the devil. Romans 5 and 6 says, For when we were yet without sin, without strength, excuse me, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. And when the Philistines see, they see the the sling whirl from the hand of David. And they see the stone fly. And they see the giant fall. And then they see David advance forward and cut off the head of Goliath. And the whole Philistine army, then they began to run. Then they began to flee. And because they know that their champions defeat, what what did that mean? That means that they were defeated. That means that they better be packing and running away. And when Israel Israel realized what had happened. They began to move forward. They began to surge forward with a shout and pursue the enemy, pushing them totally out of the Israelite territory and taking the enemy spoil from their own tents. Oh, somebody's got to hear me today. David's victory brought them the victory. Jesus' victory is what's going to bring you the victory here today. And when the victory comes in your life, it's not because you're greater, it's because he's greater. It's not because you finally figured out how to slay the sin or how to defeat the devil or how to overcome the obstacle, but it's because you continually allowed yourself to let God show up. Let Jesus Christ move in the midst of your situation again and again and again and again and again until you see the victory come to pass in your life. Hallelujah. Amen. And just let me add upon that. When that victory comes, you're going to move forward. When the, when, the, when the enemy realizes their defeat, they're going to flee. 
Amen. And you can move forward. Oh, hallelujah. And I can dare. Let me just say this. I, I'm no prophet, but let me just speak prophetically. You're not going to move forward all silent. You're not going to you're not going to move forward unmoved. Amen. But you're going to move forward with a shout. You're going to move forward in victory. You're going to move forward full of faith. You're going to move forward excited about what God is doing in your life. Amen. And you're going to spoil the enemy's camp and you're going to take everything that that devil has tried to take from you in your life. Let me put it like this. My loved ones are coming home. Hallelujah. My finances are coming back to me. Hallelujah. God is going to make a way. Hallelujah. And we're going to we're going to spoil the enemy's camp. Hallelujah. Let's all stand here today. Somebody say I'm not David. But I'm glad I know that my David. Amen. I want to challenge somebody here today. I got some I got some nice knee pads to lay at an altar. Hallelujah. Stop trying to discover the champion in you. I want somebody to begin discovering a champion who is for you. Hallelujah. You're not David, but Jesus became your David in your life. Hebrews 2, 14 through, four, through 15 says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. I pray that chains begin to break. Not just here. Amen. But chains begin to break in Warrington. Chains begin to break, amen, in Falkir County. Bondage that has once bound people by fear begins to, begins to break and snap, amen, because, because we realize, amen, that, that David is going before us, amen, that we have a champion, amen, that's already won the victory for us here today, amen. I don't care what you might be going through today. I don't care what mountain you may be trying to climb in your life or what miracle you may be seeking for yourself. Let me put it like this. I, I, I don't care how big the problem is or how small you may seem to think you are. I want to challenge somebody today. I believe that God has already made the way. God has already provided the victory. God already has it figured out in your life. But you're not David. You're not David. In other words, it's not in your control today. This is just a simple altar call, a simple thought. Just give it to God. Let go and let God. And I believe that God's going to step in. God's going to show up. God's going to make the way. But we have to give it to Jesus. Don't you worry about you trying to find it. Don't you worry about you trying to figure it all out. All you need to do is to cast your cares upon him, for he careth for you. All you need to do, amen, is give it to God today. God is going to be your champion. God's going to go before you in your battle. God's going to move before you in your life. Amen. And can I say that he knows how to make a way where there seems to be no way possible? Amen. He is still a miracle-working miracle God. Amen. My Lord, God is no respecter of persons. If he did it for a man named David, he can do it for somebody like you here today.
I believe it in the name of Jesus. Why don't we just begin to pray? Why don't we lift up our hands and our hearts? Why don't we find a place to pray to, to say, God, I'm going to give it all to you, Jesus. Lord, you see my heart, God. You see my, my soul, Jesus, today. And I love you, Jesus. I praise you, Lord. I worship you, God. Lord, I'm going to give it to you today. I'm going to give you my heart, Lord. I'm going to give you my mind. I'm going to give you my spirit, Jesus. Lord, be my David. Lord, be my champion today. Lord, be the center of my life, the center of my joy. God, I'm not going to fear the enemy any longer. I'm not going to fear the, the troubles, the tactics, the plan of the enemy. God, but I'm going to go before you. Amen. Not with a sword, not with a shield, but I'm going to go with the name of the Lord in my life. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. God, I give you praise. I give you